I'm saying it's a great pleasure to be back in your wonderful city, so thank you very much for the invitation. At the centre of the presentation, I'm going to talk about the example of value change from, uh, from Toronto, where I work now. But before that, I'm going to say a little bit about other sorts of value change I've done in my life before I was in Canada. And at the end, I'm going to say some more general things about value change. In each of the first, last five roles I had, I was actually the first person in those jobs. And so in every job, I had to go in, there was value change that had to be done right from the start. The first one, BBC Symphony Orchestra, uh, when I got there, the planning was just done as an administrative function. There was no artistic overview of the orchestra as a whole. Everything was a one-off. It had a very low profile. There are five orchestras in London. So the three aims in that job in turn right from the start. The first one, BBC Symphony Orchestra, uh, when I got there, the planning was just done and to raise the profile of the BBC Symphony Orchestra. The next job I did was at effectively the National Arts Centre of Britain, the South Bank Centre, and that was previously run by a very populist local government, very popular populist local government. Um, that was abolished by Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher in 1986, and so the government had to create new management arrangements for the National Arts Centre. So the two aims there in terms of value change were firstly to move from political control to cultural control, and then to add international quality, but without losing the local popular instincts of, of the centre. The next job I had was to be head of arts for the city of Birmingham. It's the second largest city in the UK, a um, metro area of about three million people. And when I got there, the arts was run by five different departments in the city council, and there was no coordination between them at all. There was no overall strategy for the city. Uh, it was all very white in racial terms, so there was no sense of the diversity of Birmingham. Roughly a third of Birmingham at that stage came from visible minorities. So I had three aims there. One was to create and implement the first art strategy for the whole city that there had ever been. Uh, then to broaden and enrich and link up the arts offer so you had more of a sense of, of Birmingham's diversity. And also, again, to raise the national and international profile of the arts in Birmingham. Then I went back to the BBC uh, and involved in, the, in a music festival to celebrate the millennium in the year 2000. And previously, all the BBC's festivals had been single genre festivals, and they tended to happen in one place, one city or one town. So the four aims that were fresh in this festival were to create a genuinely nationwide music festival, uh, to link up and bring together radio and television, to embrace all the different kinds of popular and classical musics in one festival, and to create a moment of millennial celebration of the year 2000. And then the last job I did before moving to Canada for 15 years was to be the founding director of this international music centre in the north of England. And previously, Gateshead had been, I mean, Gateshead still is a small town of 200,000 people on the very edge of, of England, right by the Scottish border. And all its economic motors had gone, shipbuilding, uh, iron and steel, coal, all those major industries had left the town, as in so common in Europe at that stage. And the aim was to create a new kind of international cultural centre in this rather unpromising sounding place. So it was to bring together three formerly separate organisations to create one new centre in the most deprived part of the United Kingdom and to create something that had real international impact from this very small base. And I'm not going to talk about any of those anymore, but I just wanted to say them to give you a sense of some of the other value change things I've done in my life. I'm going to talk now about the Luminati Festival in Toronto for a few minutes. This was its opening night in um, 2007, it's nearly just 10 years old. It's a festival whose foundations internally are city building, it's a classic city building institution, uh, and externally it was about raising Toronto's profile. The core of it is doing big international extraordinary things, uh, but also the creation of new work, so we've done over 100 commissions in the first 10 years, and working a lot in outdoor spaces, in found spaces, when I arrived in July 2015, uh, I could see the next thing that was going to happen was going to be the 10th anniversary of the festival in 2016. So my first responsibilities were to create that 10th anniversary festival. And we started planning 
on the basis of the same planning as the previous nine years. That's to say a festival that was spread around the city, that was dispersed around the city. But we wanted to do something more ambitious than that. We wanted to do something that would give a real sense of a fresh start for the festival, a new, a new, to make a new first impression, if I can put it that way. And in 2014, two years, two years before the 10th anniversary, the festival had opened up in the Portlands of the city, which is a very derelict area, about 20 minutes from the main downtown, a ruined ex-industrial cathedral, the Richard L. Hearn Electricity Generating Station. And it's, it, it's opened in 1950, it had run for 30 years, then it had closed, since then, really, it's, it's had no public life at all. All it's been used for is film shoots. So all those films that have wild, dystopian uh, final shootouts, films like Robocop, like Suicide Squad, Minority Report, a lot of them were shot in this building. And in uh, 2014, the festival, for the first time, nothing public had ever been done in this building. And for the first time, the festival took a gala dinner into this extraordinary environment. And it was the most, I mean, gala dinners in Toronto were always held in posh, comfortable, pleasant, clean, safe places. And this was the opposite of every one of those. And there was a sort of frisson of danger. There were raccoons running around amongst your feet. The roof leaked. Um, it, it had in every sense of being a dangerous, dystopian environment. And the experience of having a formal dinner in that environment, you can imagine how extraordinary it was. And it was talked about for the whole of the rest of the summer. So the next year, in 2015, the festival went back there for another gala dinner. But it also took one piece of programming to this extraordinary place, which was the Unsound Music Festival, created in Krakow in Poland. It calls itself a festival of electronic music, of experimental music, but really, it's a festival of contemporary culture. And for Luminato, what was so exciting about this was it reached a young public that the festival had been really struggling to reach previously and had never managed to reach. So in 2016, we decided to take, as our 10th birthday extraordinary special gesture, to take the entire festival to the Herd Generating Station. So we created inside the building separate venues effectively. This was a, we built this theatre and the only thing conventional about this theatre is it has a stage and it has an audience. I mean everything else in terms of environment is unlike any theatre anybody would ever have seen. For, that was for a nine hour um, sequence of plays by National Theatre of Scotland which was chronicling the 15th century history of Scotland. Then we created a music space for about 2,000 people. Uh, this is Baroque music there. We did every kind of music you can imagine. This was a Judy Garland concert done by Rufus Wainwright. This was a dance project that came from Montreal and Quebec. Uh, and this was, we brought the Unsound Festival back again. So that was a big music space. Then we invited the German company Rimini Protocol who do immersive theater. That's theater where there isn't an audience. The audience are the performers. This was the space for it being built. This was the thing finally built. So this was devoted to what I would say the commerce of war. The issue of arms creators, arms manufacturers, arms trades, mercenaries, all the things in war that are about money. And as a member of the public, you went in through those yellow, door, yellow doors and you would be an arms dealer, you would be a peace negotiator, you would be a mercenary, and you had this very, actually very disturbing and rather frightening experience in this quite simple looking space. Then, uh, we, um, yeah. then we brought two artworks to the festival. This was one outdoors by the French sculptor Pierre Rouy. Um, it's a nude, but it's made out of concrete, which is an unusual material from which to make a nude. But her head has been replaced by a colony of live bees. Um, and it had been bought by the Art Gallery of Ontario, never shown, because obviously you can't show live bees in an art gallery. Uh, and we, so we, were, we actually gave them the first opportunity ever to display this work. The other work was by a Canadian sculptor called Michel de Bruyne. This is on the face of it, a very simple, ordinary mirror ball, shooting jets of light into every corner of the building. But the extraordinary thing about this is it's eight meters across. So it's an absolutely enormous mirror ball. Uh, and it had a, a very powerful effect in terms of shooting light around the building. 
Then we discovered the main control room of the power station. We were thinking, what would you do in the context of an arts festival with a control room of a power station? Well, it's obvious, you turn it into a high-end restaurant. So we, um, we got a very famous restaurateur from Montreal who created an extraordinary restaurant environment in that space. And then this is now just a series of images from the, from the 10th anniversary. So I'm going to say a little bit about the, uh, what worked, the successes of doing the festival in this space. I'll tell you a bit about what the challenges were. And then I'll just end with five things more generally about value change. So the things that were good uh, were it was a completely unfamiliar space. So the audience had no particular expectations at all, so everything was fresh, everything was exciting. There was a new sense of community and campus. So the 740 members of the, of the 740 artists and all the members of the audience were all just working together in the same space, which is a very unusual thing for an arts festival to do to this degree. We could completely reinvent the way we dealt with the public in front of house terms because they had no expectations of this building. They had no idea what to expect. We could do anything. We could treat them in any way we liked. And there were, we did fresh things that we wouldn't normally have done. Uh, we invited 20 arts partners into these spaces because the place is so huge, we didn't need it all for the festival. And they brought a lot of other programming, again a lot of it which reached communities that the festival didn't usually reach. We really reconnected with all our stakeholders, our government stakeholders, corporate partners, donors, audiences. Uh, we made very powerful re-engagements with these people which are real financial benefits now as we enter the second decade. Huge media impact, images were everywhere, and it was a social media sensation. And this is an interesting one. For the first time, we sold all our own tickets for the festival because Normally, in previous years, the festival has been in other people's venues, and what that means is the, the other venues have the data of the audience, they have their details. So what was fantastic about this for us was because we sold all the tickets, for the first time ever, we knew who every single member of the audience was, which was a, a major stage. Uh, challenges, things that didn't quite work. Timing, eight months is a ridiculously short time to do a project like this. It should have had two or three years. The fact that we had no walls anywhere meant that there was, um, you could see everything, which was great, but it also meant the sound leaked from space to space, so that was a scheduling issue. Uh, the city council in Toronto, which in our first two years had regulated us as a festival, because we were there for 17 days in this building, we were regulated as a building, which was, as you can imagine, more, more complex and more demanding. And I think the last thing I'd say is about the staff. I think probably we underestimated the physical strain on the staff in this building, the, the long hours, it was dirty, it was a really difficult place to work. And I think uh, the staff were fantastic, but I probably underestimated the, the physical strain on them working in that space. But by most of the indicators, the ticket sales were the biggest ever, the corporate partnerships were the biggest ever, and the individual donations were. So by all those sort of indicators, uh, it, it, was a, it made a real success for the 10th anniversary. And I'm just going to end now quickly with five more general things about value change, which may be things we come back to later on. Um, first thing is the importance of creating a sense of urgency and necessity. In, in projects, a recognition that change is needed, convincing people that going into the unknown is actually better and safer than sticking with what you have, and that there's never enough time. So always in big value change journeys, you're having to drop things. The trick is to drop the right things and not the things that will damage you further on. Secondly, the importance in all value change journeys of a really simple central mission or vision um, it, it directs the whole project. It should be possible to communicate it in detail in five minutes. It should always be possible to summarize it in 60 seconds. And if it isn't, you have the wrong vision. Third thing is the, the incredible importance of, of communicating the vision internally and externally. This is always the most important thing of value change journeys leading all communications from the top until the vision is really securely embedded, teaching the new behavior and the culture by example, so you're always modeling the behavior, the values that you're trying to create, you're modeling them yourself, so staff can see that, 
and always describing the world 15% ahead of where it currently is. If you go more than 15%, you, you're, you sound like a crazed fantasist. But if you go less than 15%, nothing changes. So you always have to describe a world a little ahead of where you actually are. Then, because a lot of these journeys are very long, and it's easy for staff to lose heart, incredible importance of some, what we call quick wins, some early results that the staff can see that the journey is going in the right direction. Plan them, don't leave them to chance, because if you leave them to chance, they won't happen. And do them early, have one or two really early quick wins, so the staff, before they get tired, before they get demoralized, can see that the journey is going in the right direction. And then lastly, this is where I'll finish, the most important thing of all is always looking forward, only looking backwards to learn from things, never, to, never um, to be revisionist. So you should always be thinking, what can we learn from what went well? And then things that didn't go well, not whose fault was it, but what can we learn from it? And the key question is always, if we were doing the same thing tomorrow, what would we do different? So that every inch of every journey, every major change journey, is built progressively on the inch before. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, this is the rickshaw stop in San Francisco. It's a music venue and a bar, and on one Monday night, something very unusual happened there. People were lined up all around the block. It wasn't a Friday or Saturday night, and it wasn't a famous band inside. It was San Francisco Opera. standard decision making, uh, but we knew we wanted to try an experiment and we knew if we took too long, it may never happen. We hoped to have about 100 people attend this event. I mean, it's opera and a bar on a Monday night. Uh, but instead, nearly 400 people came. We had lines wrapped around the block and we were completely sold out. 
And this event wasn't just different for us because we had singers on stage wearing jeans and they were performing in front of pictures of Beyonce. We changed just about everything for the audience. First was the price point. There was a $10 cover charge. Uh, the least expensive seats you can get at San Francisco Opera are about $30 US, and premium seats are much more expensive. And then we also had ushers. Now, we often have, always have ushers at the Opera House, but these ushers, who are dressed in costume here, were volunteers who were opera enthusiasts. They came out fully decked in, in their wigs and costumes and looked amazing. And they were kind and welcoming, and they knew a lot about opera, and they shared that passion and knowledge with the audience. And they told attendees about the songs that were being performed uh, and, and helped them appreciate the whole experience and make them feel like they weren't quite so lost or intimidated. And this was in direct response to something we'd heard from people, that opera was intimidating for them. They were afraid of doing it wrong, so to speak. And off to the side, we had a rack filled with costumes for people to try on. And usually our costumes are on stage. They're not available to the audience. Uh, but on this night, anyone could come up and take photos, put on costumes, and people posted it on social media and essentially did marketing for us for our very next event. The graphic look of the marketing of this event was also a huge departure for us. It was done in a graffiti style, and, and maybe more importantly, it was done in a matter of minutes by just two of us, myself being one of them. Um, the other thing was we made a brand new website. In one day, we reached out only to alternative media, not to our traditional media partners, and just made decisions very, very quickly. The name of the uh, event, Barely Opera, was had two meanings. One being that it's sort of opera light, it's, it's almost opera, but also bare, meaning it's stripped down, that it was opera not in the full gala sort of way, but just a very sort of casual experience. And instead of the typical uh, translations you would have at the opera, we used memes behind the singers uh, from the internet. They were funny and irreverent and accessible, really trying to make it very, very approachable for our audience. And the night was a huge success for us. The, the young artists that performed loved it, and the staff working on it loved it too. Um, this is a selfie that some of the young artists took of themselves with the audience behind them. Um, these are some of the tweets we got from that night from the audience. Great energy at Barely Opera last night as young opera singers got tipsy and belted it out. Do it again, guys. Uh, Barely Opera is exactly what we need. Fun, a reverent night of great singing accessible to everyone. Opera is not snobby, it's great fun. Goodness, Barely Opera is a blast. Drinks, opera, a spinning wheel of songs, and cat memes. Barely Opera is the sexiest thing to happen to Monday night since hashtag I don't know. So this one night experiment inspired us to entirely rethink how we approach doing opera in our new venue, the Toby Atrium Theater, and also how we approached innovation. We're a nearly 100-year-old company. We're entrenched in doing things the way they've always been done, and innovation has been thought to be both too costly to do from a staffing perspective and a money perspective. And this experience showed us that we could be nimble and we could test ideas and experiences quickly and inexpensively. And so from it, we created a new arm called SF Opera Lab. SF Opera Lab produces experimental theater uh, and performances in our 300-seat atrium theater. This theater is one-tenth the size of our main theater, which has over 3,000 seats. And really, for the audience, it's much more intimate. You can see here that the audience is just feet away from the performers. And we're continuing to produce pop-ups throughout the Bay Area. Um, these are inexpensive to produce, they generate a profit for us, and, and most importantly, they get us in front of a brand new audience. Instead of expecting that the audience will always come to us, instead we now go to them and the communities and the venues that they frequent. And our audiences are just growing more and more for each one of these events. So in terms of reaching a new audience, these pop-up events, 71% of the audience is under the age of 45, and nearly 60% is brand new to San Francisco Opera. They've never had any experience with us before. If you compare that to our Opera House, our main stage, 80% of the audience is over 45, and half is over the age of 60. 
So that's it, right? That's our that's a nice, simple success story. We reached a whole new audience in one night, right? Wrong. That's not the interesting part of the story. The interesting part is how a 92-year-old arts organization with people in it who are very resistant to change, with limited resources and limited time, managed to pull something like this off. So now is the interesting part. How in the world did we do it? Uh, it began with Stanford University's design school called the D School. This is a class at Stanford's D School called D Leadership. Uh, we participated in their intensive D Leadership course and we were the first performing arts organization to be selected to be a part of it. Uh, while there, we were paired with two students of the D School to learn about design thinking. And these are our two D School leaders, Zaina Barakat and Madhav Thai. Zaina had been a journalist for 12 years and was on a professional fellowship at Stanford. And Madhav was a MBA student who was previously a product manager at Dell Computers. If it sounds random that the two of them, who had very little experience or exposure with opera, were paired with us, it was done on purpose. Um, the whole idea of the D School is that it's a place where people come together who have all sorts of different expertises to solve different problems using a methodology called design thinking. The idea is that people come from different backgrounds and perspectives can better challenge conventions and come up with better solutions, and design thinking gives them a way to collaborate. And this was our entire team. We were made up of people from different departments of the opera and even included on the bottom left corner, Matthew Schilbach, who is now the general director of San Francisco Opera. So I keep using the term design thinking, but what is it? Design thinking is a human-centered approach to solving problems. It leads to new solutions that are emotionally meaningful and functional. The person who came up with this term is this gentleman, David Kelly. Over 25 years ago, he founded a company called IDEO, a company that I now do work with, and it's also where our D School leader, Zaina Barakat, uh, also works. And David Kelly founded the Stanford D School as well. So let me tell you a little bit about IDEO. It's a global design and innovation consultancy that uses design thinking. IDEO makes things that you can touch and hold. For example, they made the first commercial mouse for Apple. They're also constantly looking at ways that they can explore doing new things. For example, what is the future of mobility? IDEO is envisioning new possibilities for self-driving cars. And what's the future of religion? IDEO is working with several Jewish organizations to think of ways for Judaism to reach a younger audience. So IDEO has about 650 staffers around the world, and the key thing is that people come from different professional expertises. Every project that IDEO does has an interdisciplinary team that works from start to finish using design thinking. So David Kelly created a consulting firm for design thinking, and he started the D School at Stanford, which teaches design thinking. But why does design thinking even exist? Because uh, people don't always do what they say they do. People don't always do what we think they do and people don't always do what they think they do. Um, I love this because it's a reminder about being user-centered. It isn't simply about asking people what they want and then doing it. It's about getting inspired by the audience and by other industries and experiences and trying to understand the audience's needs even when they don't always articulate them. So now we're really gonna dive in. There's a graphic here that explains the design thinking process. It's more like overlapping phases rather than a precise sequence of steps, but there are three general phases. Inspiration, ideation, and implementation. Inspiration means exploring the challenge or opportunity by researching, by talking to people or experiencing things. Ideation is really where you start generating, developing, and testing ideas and then implement, implementation is how you turn those ideas into reality. Um, it, it takes longer than 15 minutes to truly understand design thinking, but I'm just gonna give you an introduction and show you how we used it at San Francisco Opera. Phase one, inspiration. Keeping an open mind, getting out of your office and your bubble, talking to and observing the audience you're trying to reach, empathizing with your audience, putting yourself in their shoes, immersive experiences, and reframing the problem. 
Keeping an open mind was much more difficult than you might imagine for many of our staff. It's easier to, to put blinders on and, and believe we can only do things one way and only speak to peers in our industry to support our thinking, have a bit of an echo chamber in that way. Design thinking changed that for us. And the first thing we needed to do was to get out of the Opera House and out of our neighborhood. So we met with some really interested interesting people in related but very different organizations, um, like Hadari Davis, who's the artistic director of Young, Gifted, and Black. They're a performance group based in Oakland uh, of students aged 6 to 18, and we really chose this group because they're outside of the world of opera, but yet they're exactly the kind of audience we want to be reaching. And we usually just talk to other classical arts organizations, and it, it makes our world pretty insular. Uh, one of the great things we came away from our interview with Hadari was him saying, don't wait for the community to come to you, go to the community. So another research method is immersing yourself in an experience that may inspire your design. Each member of our team was asked to go to an event that we typically wouldn't attend. Um, that way we'd have more empathy for those who don't typically come to the opera, because after all that's what we're hoping to do is to get new people to come to the opera. These are some examples of, of roller derby and some uh, 6 a.m. morning dance parties in San Francisco that some people do before they come to work. Um, and this is Hood Slam. And this is something I went to. It's a popular, sort of over-the-top theatrical wrestling show that happens in a warehouse in Oakland. This is not the sort of thing that I typically attend and I felt very out of my element in going. Um, it's about as far from opera as you can get and yet its fans possess the same level and passion and enthusiasm for it as our fans do for opera. Sadly, I was the only one of our seven team members who actually did this, who went out and did something that was out of their comfort zone. And the thing was, this, this failure was a valuable lesson for us. It showed our team that what we were asking people to do, to go to the opera when it's something they don't typically do, is really, it's a big ask. It's a really big leap, and it puts them outside of their comfort zone. It gave us a newfound understanding of our potential unreached audience, and we truly empathized with them. So in the inspiration phase, you're obviously exploring a problem. For us, our initial challenge we thought was, how do we bring more people to the main opera house? But what we quickly saw was that it wasn't about the opera house. It was really about getting that whole new generation to fall in love with opera. If we don't address this, we have a much bigger problem on our hands. So we also did some analogous research, which really means looking for someone or something who isn't in your field of expertise, but something in their experience relates to yours. So for example, we spoke to the head waitress at an upscale restaurant in Napa Valley. Uh, to get a sense from her of how she makes new guests feel welcome and special, but also how she makes regular uh, patrons come back again and again. Because for us, that's a challenge we really struggle with constantly, of how do we keep our existing subscribers happy while also appealing to a brand new audience. Uh, in addition, we spoke to a cantor at a synagogue in New York to see how they're attracting a, a younger membership. And we also spoke with a wedding planner and a, a new movie theater venue in San Francisco where patrons can bring food and drinks into the theater. What all of these individuals helped us realize was the, set, the value of the total experience, that it's not just what happens on stage, but everything that is part of their experience coming to an event. So phase two is ideation. That's really brainstorming with direction and low fidelity prototypes. So probably the most important thing for us was getting out of the office and talking to people using these prototypes. Uh, and particularly, we talked to the audience we wanted to reach. So our, our initial response when we were prompted by our leaders um, was we said, oh, we use surveys. That's how we know what people want. We ask them, they survey in a survey what they want. Um, but as you can imagine, that isn't enough. And people surveyed may not actually say what they really think or want. So we decided to go to San Francisco's Ferry Building, and we just approached complete strangers. Uh, this was outside of our neighborhood and again, outside of our comfort zone. We told them that we had an immersive theater experience we wanted them to try. And when I say immersive theater experience, I mean we had ripped up pieces of paper as tickets and we had a Word document on an iPad. It was very, very bare bones. We asked them if they wanted to wear party masks that we bought at a party store. And this was not polished perfection, which is really what we always strive to do is perfection. Um, 
But this exercise launched conversations for us into completely different topics that were fascinating. And the biggest skeptic in our group, after an hour of doing this, said, you know, I'm shocked. I thought we do surveys, and that's how we talk to people. That's how we get what we need. And, and now I see how valuable it is to be talking to people face to face, people that aren't in our sphere of influence. So after all of this, it was time to do something. Um, we had to make a prototype by the end of our two and a half month course, with a D leadership course, and the goal was it needed to reach 100 people. So we were inspired by everything we learned, and we decided that rather than having the community come to us, we would go out into the community. But the problem was, we only had 10 days. So we didn't have a choice, so we got right to work. One of the things we had to come up with was a name for the event. And we even had a brainstorming session to help us break from convention and get inspired for what this event might be called. At this point, we brought together a larger subset of opera employees, not just the D leadership team, to get their thoughts and ideas. And we decided our target was to get people in their 30s to come to this event. And so we started brainstorming and thought, well, okay, people from in their 30s may have a nostalgia for the 1980s. So we posed the question, what do you miss about the 80s? So here are some of the responses from people. Um, staff were encouraged to put their ideas up on post-it notes, which you'll find post-it notes have a revered place in design thinking. And one of our most skeptical staff persons, my, my favorite response, the things she missed from the 1980s, was she came up and she said, what do I miss about the 1980s? Sex. Um, sometimes a brainstorm doesn't turn into an answer. It, it, what it does do is it releases creative energy, it helps overcome hesitance to new ideas, and it helps break the tension, whether it's by humor or, or otherwise. And as a culture, the opera is one that's had a lot of hesitation around experimentation and new ideas. We've always done things a certain way. Opera's been around for hundreds of years, as have we. And as a nonprofit, we've had very little appetite or money for experimentation or risk, and often it stops new ideas dead in their tracks. So phase three was implementation. Uh, the key to that in design thinking is starting small, don't get too attached to your ideas. If something doesn't work, learn from your tests and keep evolving. Make experimentation a part of your organization's culture, and make people feel safe to take risks and be rewarded for doing so. These things were hard for us as an organization. We're an $80 million opera company known for putting on grand scale opera. We don't know how to start small. We literally spent 100,000 US dollars on a prototype before realizing that what we built wasn't something the audience even wanted. We'd never spoken to our audience about it besides one survey question. And rather than experimenting and refining the idea, we stayed attached to it. And we learned, we had to learn how to test things and be willing to make changes based on results. So as I mentioned earlier, experimentation hasn't been part of a culture. There's a real feel of a fear of failure and taking risks. So experimentation rarely happened. Or, or rather, we had an appetite to take risks on stage, but not off stage. Um, but we also weren't taking small and inexpensive risks. We needed to think small, test something, refine it, and scale up accordingly. And we needed to change our culture to ensure that staff felt supported and not vulnerable when they did take these calculated risks. So the SF Opera Lab pop-ups have allowed us to do just that. We can put together a pop-up event for as little as $3,000 and make a profit on it. There we can test ideas like signature cocktails or immersive experiences, irreverent humor, etc., and watch our audience engage their reaction. We can see what resonates with people and is worth bringing to the Opera House, and we can also move on from ideas that don't work at the pop-ups. Um, the scale is small, the investment is small, and so the potential risk or hit to us is small. Because of design thinking, we as an organization should never undertake a $100,000 prototype again. These principles were the core of our success. Don't confuse art with design. Set a quick deadline. Stop talking and do something. If you're spending a lot on a prototype, you're doing it wrong. Uh, bring together a group of unexpected collaborators. Perfectionism will get in the way of taking chances. Leaders, please empower your people to make decisions. And innovation doesn't always mean a technological solution. You know, for us, number two, setting a quick deadline, that's hard. We operate on schedules that are five years out. So for us to execute a successful event in 10 days was almost unfathomable. 
in terms of spending a lot of money, as I previously mentioned, we were doing just that. So we were doing it wrong. We learned how to improve it and be better. Um, bringing together that group of unexpected collaborators is key. Having that variety of different viewpoints is critical to avoid what we call groupthink and to get a fresh perspective. Uh, this next one about perfectionism was one of the hardest things for us to overcome. Um, we're used to putting the highest quality product on stage and we wouldn't do it until it's perfect. And through the pop-ups, we can still strive and, and do achieve very high standards, but combating perfectionism allows us to be much more nimble. Uh, leaders and empowering employees to make decisions, this is one that's still a challenge for us, to be honest. Um, some areas of our organization are fabulous at empowering their teams, others are not. Uh, so we're working on that to make it a, a bigger part of our culture across the board. Uh, and this last point is important about innovation and technology. Uh, innovation is often synonymous with technology. And in some cases, it really is the solution. Uh, but human-centered design thinking allows us to look at the entire picture of the experience. For us, innovation was taking opera out of the opera house and creating a new experience for our audience. We could have built a fancy and costly app but it wouldn't have addressed the inherent barriers, the intimidation and the uncertainty that many new to opera face. We could have built it, but they may not have come. And unless we built something that really resonates with our audience, they won't. So finally, it's not about you and what you like. It's about the audience you're trying to reach. Design it for them. This is really the end. <laughs> さん、こんにちは。私は中台基金館のコンサンさんです。えっと、私は、ま、6年前に中台基金館に入り、で、逆に JUT。ファンデーション えっと、花屋さん、そして家具を、あの、店舗を運営する事業です。そして右側が私が所属する
それはあの先ほど見たアジアのような建設的な都市にならないように私たちは2つの方法でやりました、えっと、1つは資源をオープンするそして機械を作ることここでいう資源というのは空間ですねスペースです、えっと、ディベロータータとししててたくさんの空間を持っていましてそれは、えー、と私たちにとって最大の資源ですそして私たちの活動はそこから始まりますこれはちょうど10年前に配置されたあの倉庫ですけれども私たちの活動はそこから始まりますそれは当時の様子ですこの倉庫を活用してミュージアム・オブ・トゥマローを作りましたえっ、ー、とまあ短期間の展覧会でしたけれども明日を考える展覧会でしたそれは最初の活動でしたでこれからはこの3つのプログラムについてあの、えっと、急いでご紹介したいと思います、えっと、最初のプログラムが明日博物館という、まあ、展覧会ですねあの実の物理的な空間ではなくて展覧会のプログラムですその空き地を使って未来をテーマにした大型の展覧会プログラムですそしてあのそれも同じように物理的な空間ビューティングがなくて、まあ、いろんな実験的な研究やワークショップあるいは展覧会を作る建築学院をプログラムです、まあ、つまり建築を学ぶプログラムですそして最後はアーバンコーという都市にもう使われなくなった建物をアートスペースにするプログラムですこの3つを軸に私たちは活動してきましたで要約するとミュージアム・オフ・トゥ・マロは未来を模索する展覧会プログラムですで建築、えっと、中華建築学院というのは都市の現状を応じてさまざまな知見をするプログラムですまあ最後のアーバンコーはクリエイティブなインビインキュベーションのプログラムです、まあ、いくつかの事例を紹介しますこれは都市の真ん中に田んぼを作った、まあ、普段はありえないような空間を、まあ、アーティストと一緒に組んで展覧会を作りました人間と都市人間と自然の関係についていろいろ研究実験をしてきましたそしてこれはあの、まあ、ロバティカル・ヴィリッジ垂直の村というテーマでオランダの建築家 NVRDB ともコラボレーションをして、まあ、研究をしましたいろんな提案をして台北市について提案をしましたそしてその研究成果を展覧会にして、えっと、展覧会にしましたそしてまあ建築学院というのはいろんな建築のあり方を模索してえっと違法建築をテーマにした展覧会ですまあ台北によく見かける屋上の上に違法の増築の建築がよく見かけるんだけれどもあの私たちはわざと違法建築を作りましたそれは違法建築をマイナスに捉えるじゃなくてなぜ台北の人は違法建築を必要としているかをもう一度取り直す展示でしたそして廃墟も研究しましたまあ再開発をまず空き,空き家とか建物を使っていろんな実験的な活動をしましたワークショップ演劇などもしましたそして日本の森美術館とも2年前にコラボレーションしてメタボリズム展を台北に巡回しましたまあ、それは60年前に日本の建築家は都市の未来をどのように想像していたかをあのご検証する展覧会でしたで昔のことではなくてその時の研究の、まあ、ムーブメントが今の若い建築家にどのような影響を与えているかを、まあ、ここで展あの講演会なども行って一緒に考えましたまあ、メタボリズム展の研究者クルハスも台北まで招聘しまして、えっと、このようなディスカッションをしましたで最後はアーバンコーというプログラムですこのように、まあ、再開発を待つエリアなんですけれどもそれをそのまま置くかあるいはアーティストに空間を与えてア,ア
、えー、とアトリエとか、まあ、展示のスペースにしてもらったとかあとフェスティバルをやるとかオープンスタジオとか演劇を行うとかそれをやってきましたさっきの,あのプログラムは2年間で終わりましたけれどもその後政府に依頼されて政府が持っている倉庫の運営委託をしましたえっとまあ倉庫の設備、まあ、ハートの設備にしてそして市民に参加してあ参加しやすいイベントも企画しましたそしてその空間の中にコワーキングスペース若手デザイナーの,あの空間にもしていますそのクリエイティブな場にもなっていますであの今見たのは、えっと、古い市場の建物を使って、まあ、新富町文化市場というプログラムが去年から始まりますこれも古い空間を使って、まあ、コーキングスペースにしています若いクリエイティブなあの人がここで集まっていますでそれぞれのプロジェクトごとに私たちは、まあ、出版もあのたくさんしていますで振り返るとあの10年間私たちの活動がとやってきましたでさっき皆さんに紹介した最初の頃の倉庫の建てる場所なんですけれども去年からあの美術館が設立しましたえっと、今まで私たちは台北市のあちこちで遊牧的な形で活動をしてきましたけれどもこれからは美術館を拠点に、えっと、長期的で、まあ、もっとあの長いスパンで活動をしていきたいと考えていますでこれが美術館の外観ですけれどもあの美術館のデザイナー、まあ、内部の空間は日本の建築家青木淳さんのデザインでロゴのデザインは菊池敦樹さんにお願いしていますで、まあ、うちの美術館のミッションとしてはもちろんプラットフォームとして若いあの才能のある人に発揮してもらいたいそして、えー、と将来を向かってシンクタンクの役割もし,していきたいんですねそして都市を考えるその触媒カタリストとしての役割もしていきたいですであの私たちの空間はそんなに大きくないんですがあの今までやっ,たやってきたこと建築のこと都市を考えることそして現代アートをやっていきたいそしてちょっとあの別の美術館と違って未来をテーマにするというあの方向性を持っていますこれは美術館の、えー、とロビーですで全体的に開放的な空間となっていますで町のつながりを持ったような空間ですでこれは去年の,あの開館の時の展覧会ですけれども「本2025という10年後の生活を考えるというテーマの展覧会でしたで2年間もかけて台湾の建築家と台湾の企業と一緒に、まあ、模索をしてきましたこの開館展はまさに美術館のミッションを目指した実践ですね、まあ、将来をというふうに考えるそしてこれは展示の風景となりますで美術館の中の展示だけではなくて屋外にもあの観客が入れるような等身大のパビリオンを作りました美術館の周りに公園がありますそれでこのような展示もしましたで昨年に誕生したこの中体美術館は単なる箱物ではありませんあの美術館が一番重要なのはそのソフトウェアですで私たちは10年前からその活動をしてきましたつまり美術館は10年間の蓄積があったからこそ設立するものですで私たちは単なるあの土地開発そして建設業者
として見てはいません、えっと、企業も社会の一,一員ではありますのであの私たちの活動を通してあの建築の建築を考えてもらう建築への重視を呼びかけたいです都市開発は単なるビジネスではなくてより良い生活環境の実践でもありますで改革者としての中退基金会であり続けたいですで私たちの活動を通してより良い都市にしたいもっと多様的で、まあ、クリエイティブなシティにしていきたいですね一人でもあの都市を考えて建築を考えているあの一人でも増えれば都市は変わると思いますそしてあの考えるそして実践する将来は変わると思いますで最後にはあのよ,いより良い明日をという言葉にあのそれはあのうちのスローガンとなっていますけれどもその言葉を今ここにいる皆さんに送りたいと思いますご清聴ありがとうございます。<笑>